a couple years ago. Like, you know what? I don't really, I don't really enjoy it. So we went to Pongo. <laughs> 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 That's definitely. He made it. He made it while studying computer science at Berkeley. I remember. What's up, dude? Yeah. Sorry, I left without you. That's okay. Yeah, I was like, okay. Yeah. Okay. Are you, are you filming yes. for us? Well, it's, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sending me that. Oh, yeah, Brian. Yeah, sorry, Bill. I don't really, I don't really yeah. keep up on it. <laughs> hey, Alex. Maybe you can yeah. tell them to like scoot in, Especially so people can, can like, sit. Um, Maybe you can tell them to like scoot in, scoot yeah. in, sit. Yeah. Yeah. Some stuff like for like navigating, like, like you know. Okay, like, uh, uh, we should probably get started time. here. Um, and uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. This is our first. Uh, IGD A San Francisco event of 2012. So, Woo uh, yeah. uh, I'm uh, Alex Wilmer. I'm one of the organizers here. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed how many uh, people uh, here came from the meetup group. A lot of people. So I was pretty excited because. Uh, on the meetup group, I was watching the number go up, and we've never had so many people confirm that they're coming to one of our events. And I was just like, the whole time, I'm watching it go like 198, 199, 197. I'm like, how does it do that? And then eventually we got to 200. I'm like, woohoo! But I'm like, wait a minute, how are we going to fit 200 people in there? So um, if, I was wondering if maybe everybody can kind of go this way, because when people come in, maybe they can take the aisle seats, so if people want to like shift one over, that would be possible. That looks amazing. Okay. Okay, that's great. Um, so we've been going for four years now uh, since we rebooted. Um, who's been here since the beginning? The of what? Of, of our uh, <laughs> <laughs> group. <laughs> of the San Francisco IGDA. Is this the one that's over there at, uh, at Metreon? The Metreon? Yeah, so you're back from those days. Uh, yeah. Any other veterans? Yeah, a couple. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, so we, uh, a bunch of us uh, rebooted the, the chapter. Uh, the other organizers are uh, Tim Longo, Michael Heller, Brian Cummings, uh, Michael's over there, uh, Jordan Blackman, uh, Malcolm uh, Griffey, and uh, also Mark Delora was, and uh, uh, a few other people uh, helped start. Um, so, uh, I just wanted to also thank our sponsors, Dolby, for this incredible space. We're very fortunate to be here. Laurie is uh, at the back, and mm -hmm. I expect you all to <laughs> I'll, I'll thank her at the end. Um, also, Autodesk and David here from Autodesk representing. You can all give him a <laughs> high five. <laughs> and Fantasy Studios, nobody here from Fantasy Studios, I don't think. Um, and uh, Crystal Dynamics, and uh, Casey is here from Crystal Dynamics. Um, and, and Crystal Dynamics would be very generous tonight to also provide us with uh, beer and pizza at Il Parada uh, afterwards. So if you follow us, it's on 16th Street. It's, uh, you go out of the building, you turn right, and it's a couple of blocks, and then to the left. So just follow us, and there will be refreshments served. Um, yeah, so I just also, because this is our first event, I wanted to mention some of the names that have that spoken here at our events. So just really quickly, uh, we've had Brenda Braithwaite, John Romero, uh, Hayden Blackman, Nathan Mars, Dan Connors, Kent Jolly, Ocean Quigley,
Chris Hecker, Daryl Gallagher, uh, Scott Amos, Alex Noose, uh, Mike Roche, uh, Charlie Cleveland, Daniel James, <coughs> Jeremy Gordon, and uh, Ken Hudson. Uh, and those, that to me is like a mind-blowing list. Because I, I came from Ireland. I don't, I don't have an accent anymore, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, I That's true. Yeah. <laughs> That's my accent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know why else. I don't, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I just, the, t the talent that we have in the Bay Area, I think are extremely fortunate. And, and, uh, and tonight is no exception. <laughs> um, we shall see. <laughs> um, so, uh, also, just to mention some of the other events that are coming up, uh, the you you may know Anne and Simon from the Silicon Valley chapter. Um, they're there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, these guys are really really active and do an awesome job at organizing events, um, and they've got a couple of things coming up. So, uh, the first. Uh, I guess, yeah, so the, the first one is uh, a Google event coming up on February 15th. Uh, they also kicked off a game uh, accelerator initiative, um, and applications are due for that February 15th. Um, they are organizing and sponsoring the IGDA party for the GDC on March 7th. Um, and it says here, get on board the mothership. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, and then, um, also, if you if you uh, you know if you want to keep up to date with any of these these meetups, uh, uh, we we share uh, the same meetup site. So it's meetup.com Bay Bay Area Game and Athletic Group, um, and most of you probably know that. So, all right, I think that's it. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm really proud and, and excited to introduce the uh, studio creative director, uh, Mr. Fred Mark. Uh, thank you. Um, so, yes, it's been another reboot for the soft. It started uh, a year ago there. And uh, one of the first things I do when I go to a company like that is uh, updating the presentation I usually do at companies because um, I'm usually hired to uh, clean up the mess or uh, re restart pre-production at the company. So um, what I have to do usually is revamp the presentation so it's legal for me to actually do it at the new company. Uh, but I asked uh, Tim Longo from X Crystal Dynamics is now uh, a, a director on one of our projects at Lucas, and he asked me if I could do that presentation uh, here today. So thank you for having me. So I'm going to go through. Um, it's <coughs> I, I can take as long as you want on this. You know that 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 I could stay here for a week <laughs> and go through uh, a lot of this stuff. Um, so much so that it's actually, it was at Lucas uh, uh, presentation in two parts uh, in the main theater. So today I'll try to, to not like stay too long and uh, just do the first part. And if there's any interest on this in the second part, then I'll, I'm sure you'll, you'll let people know. So we're going to start with the first part. So my background. Um, assembly programmer a uh, very long time ago uh, at Ubisoft in the early, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, Ubisoft um, started the uh, Rayman franchise there with my, uh, with my brother-in-law, Michel Ansel, um, who did uh, Beyond Good and Evil and, and Raving Rabbits and all that kind of stuff. So we worked together at that, at that time at Ubisoft. Um, so that's two, that's why there's two Ubisoft logo. The reason is that um, I, I quit Ubisoft twice. <laughs> uh, so Ubisoft once, uh, so programming, um, design, and production on a few titles. 
uh, then I moved to the US for a company and moved to a company called Angel Studios at the time, uh, which is now Rockstar San Diego. Um, I was um, I switched to design at that point and I was a game design director <coughs> there. I did uh, Midtown Madness, uh, Midnight Club, Red Dead Revolver, and a few other titles there until Angel Studio got bought by Rockstar because it's cheaper to buy the company than to pay the royalties, so I support the company. Um, at that point, I started my own company uh, that definitely would be relevant. Uh, <laughs> for four years, I was uh, independent, basically working for publishers um, to, as I said, like clean up a lot of the issues that were there. Never hired by the teams themselves, but usually by upper management. Um, and then uh, Ubisoft uh, basically was looking for a worldwide production director to reboot their production in the entire company. Um, so I went back back to France after uh, 13, 13 years in the U.S. All my kids born in New York and California. We moved back to France, and after a year, unfortunately, we could not stand France anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, so we had to come back to California, and I, I uh, basically called call some of my friends that were at that point at Disney and got a, a job as a director of game design at Disney Interactive, where I cleaned up some of the projects there before I got a call out of nowhere from Microsoft uh, for the position of uh, you know, creative director. It was really hard for me to refuse that, that <coughs> proposition. So I say yes, <coughs> and I don't regret. So it's a pretty provocative uh, presentation because that's the way I am anyway. Um, so these are the main titles you are going to see. Game design does not exist. Video um, games as toy, Mario and the Rabbit, gameplay prototypes, and elements of gameplay toys. <coughs> <coughs> so, game design does not exist. A few quotes. So that's what I kept hearing from. So at one point when I was at Angel Studios, uh, we were first party uh, Nintendo Japan. So everything I learned about game design, and I didn't know I had learned about game design and gameplay and all this stuff, uh, was with Nintendo Japan, the uh, NCL group, uh, the Miyamoto group, basically, and my mentor was uh, uh, Mr. Yamashiro, who's head of, of NSC in Seattle. And uh, for for two years, more than two years, he tortured me uh, <laughs> doing prototypes. The only thing he could say in English was, uh, uh, it's not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> I cried a lot, not in front of him, but I think the uh, honor. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it was very, very painful, painful work. And um, one of the things I heard from them all the time, whether it was Mr. Miyamoto or Mr. Yamashiro, was that games are not made on paper, that it was absolutely uh, useless for me to, s to give him any kind of paper. Ta da! <laughs> All right. <laughs> Indeed. So everyone is a designer. Uh, yes, if you talk to everybody, everybody has game ideas, everybody has a pet project, everybody thinks that um, the company they are working in should be working on their own IPs and their own games and their own stuff, right? Ultimately, everybody is a creative person, <coughs> one subject or another. Some it's in video games, some it's in music. So ultimately, everybody is a game designer, right? Um, the problem is that document making is not game making, <coughs> right? When you're really good at writing game design documents, you're really good at writing documents. They, it's a very different skill. You know, you, you can actually write a lot about your ideas, your scenarios, and all that kind of stuff, and you'll be typing a lot of documents, and I can recognize a very good document maker about how fast you can type on the keyboard. 
when I hire a game designer, I usually am a bit, uh, you know, worry when he types really, really, really fast because he has a tendency to write a lot of documents but not necessarily touch the material and actually make games, uh, which is a very different, a different piece. Uh, so yes, <coughs> the title is very provocative. Uh, it basically means uh, if you're really that much into games, what about you make games? You know, what about you stop talking about them? You stop uh, writing about them? You stop writing documents about video games, but actually <coughs> make them, right? Like, it's not that the tools are not available nowadays. There's tons of stuff that's free. So if you're really interested in making video games, go there. There's really easy, you don't even have to code anymore, you know, you can use like stuff like, you know, Game Maker, you can create all that kind of stuff, you name it, there's, it's limitless nowadays, it's very easy, plus the web, uh, plus the IGDA or anyone you can meet that can help you actually figure it out. And um, the, uh, the key, the key way of making games, the Nintendo way, is you don't need to actually believe what I say or do, you know, do what I talk about. Uh, the key, though, is any kind of work, uh, whether it's it's uh, learning to paint, making music, um, any form of art, if you think video games are art, it all comes down to iterations. Um, so the key in this line of work that we do is iteration. And through iteration comes changes and modifications it's going to be, uh, what's going to be crucial is your ability not only to iterate, to accept it, the principle of iteration, of uh, trying things, uh, you know, not believe them on faith, but actually implement things and try them. And the key ability to actually recognize <coughs> failure, uh, failure in the prototype <coughs> or failure of your idea, which is much harder and require an extraction of your ego of, of what you're doing um, so that you can actually still see what you are working on as it is and of what you believe it is. Uh, hence, every now and then, the very hard task of going through playtests and denying uh, denying what happens in playtests. You know, like, yeah, it's, you just can't play video games. No, it's because it sucks. Uh, so, so the key, again, is the, um, that actually, ultimately, game designs emerge from iterations. Uh, and you can talk to a lot of guys that are actually pretty, pretty good in video games, and they will tell you the same thing. Like, the game that they have at the end doesn't look anywhere near uh, what they thought the game was going to be, or why they were iterating and doing their prototypes. Something emerged something came out of nowhere and they were able to recognize that as actually much better than what they thought about and make that the game. You know, Will Wright about SimCity, right? It's uh, his first game, which he programmed, by the way, didn't write about. Uh, one of his first game was Raid on, on Berlin Bay or something like that. It was a helicopter flying above cities uh, shooter, right? And it turned out that while he was making that game, the tool to actually build the little cities under the helicopter was more fun than the game itself. <laughs> Hence, SimCity. Um, so success through iteration is a principle. What does that mean, what is a principle? A principle is a law of nature. It, it's inevitable. There's nothing you can do, you can think it's not true, you can, you can do whatever, you know, apply religion to it, you can do whatever you want, it's still implicable. Um, iteration, success through iteration is, is a fact. Um, that's why you're here as a human being, because your cells, you know, iterate. <coughs> you know, they screw up, and the, the, uh, that little part actually is better than the other part survives, and in the end, you know, we have become human beings, and pretty successful as a, as a compilation of atoms. So that iteration of atoms that we have become you know, here today. And so um, success through iteration actually does, does work. You have to trust it. It's one of the hard things to do when you're iterating is that um, 
there are moments where it just doesn't come, you know, for a very long time. Uh, and in a lot of, again, like art forms, uh, someone can be working on a song or a painting for years, you know, and just work on it again, and it still doesn't work, put it aside, work on something else, and then come back at it and work at it again, and someday it just comes out. So the key, again, is to be open to this and actually understand that it is a fun sport. So, as a Nintendo way, and, and the way I like, again, which you don't need to follow, is to <coughs> trust prototyping. So really prototype, prototype, prototype. But everybody talks about prototyping, and we'll talk about, about that a bit, a bit later. Uh, but of course, you know, we have short times when everybody's not Nintendo. Uh, you know, the, not everybody has a uh, 19 in the bank uh, to actually you know, even screw up <laughs> what they're doing now and come back in a few years. Or so we have to find ways to actually be able to iterate really well, really fast. Uh, but we cannot iterate. Definitely. So, we need to focus on what is the most important aspect of video games. So, we're, we're going to talk about a little bit like video games as toys. <coughs> so, the question I ask usually people in, in the crowd and a few now you know, can answer because it's becoming more common knowledge. Great. You know, to understand what business we are here when we make video games. Uh, we have to understand that there are huge misconceptions about what, what we think is truth, right? If I ask in what business McDonald's usually is, I get, you know, that it, McDonald's is in the food business, in the hamburger business, and all that kind of stuff. Where, in fact, it's the biggest real estate owner in the world. Uh, they don't make money by selling 99 cents shitty burger, right? <laughs> <laughs> they, there's no margin, you know? Every time there is like the slightest, you know, planes don't take off anymore, McDonald goes down, right? Because, because we have, well, you know, the price of, uh, you know, the shipment of burgers is, is gone, so there's no margin, there's no money there. What they do is that basically they sell uh, the uh, McDonald license to licensee, right? Um, they help them find the most incredible spots in every city, in everywhere in the world, and they make them pay for the mortgage, right? So McDonald's own the estate, the real estate, right? the place, but it's the person that has the McDonald's license that pays for it, right? In the end, who's got, you know, <laughs> that little place in the middle of Paris, or, or in Venice, or anywhere in New York, the world, it's McDonald's, right? So McDonald's, uh, and guess who's doing the same kind of like play right now, who sells coffee? Right? <laughs> Why? Why are there Starbucks at every corner in every city? Hey, I wonder, because they sell coffee, no way. So, you know, you have to be really careful when, when we have to be really careful, and I'm always very careful of what I believe, because <clears throat> most of the time they are things behind things that when we dig a little bit, we can be pretty surprised. So the second question I ask when I talk about video games is what is a console like? So I get a lot of answers, right? I get a lot of answers about what is, what is a game console? Uh, nothing, right? <laughs> what is it? It's, it's just, it's a, it's a box. You know, it's, I'm sorry, it doesn't do anything. You know, I, I plug it and I turn it on and there's some some stuff that comes on, uh, in itself, it's actually empty. <coughs> um, it's only when you download something, or if you put a disk in it, or a cartridge, that it actually becomes useful, right? Before that, it's just a box, you know, you can't even, you know, some of the hardware, you can actually plug in and heat stuff on it. <laughs> uh, but, but other than that, it's, it has no use whatsoever, you know, it's just consuming energy for nothing. Um, the reason why we invented the console uh, is because when you were plugging a new cartridge 
Um, in the console, you, know, you were changing toys. You were just, you're just a multi-toy system. Uh, you know, I can go and put a cartridge in there, and now I, I race cars, and then I put another cartridge in it, and now I shoot people, and and I plug another cartridge, and I'm on a spaceship. Ultimately, it's a toy. That's what it is. You know, you. You can have fantasies about the most incredible stories you're going to talk about, and how your character design is going to be amazing, and how your anything you want. Ultimately, it's still a freaking toy. You know, you're not going to change the world. It's a toy, right? You're not solving cancer. <laughs> you're not like it's not about you know solving AIDS or anything like that. It's a, you're you're in the toy business, whether you like it. has been making toys for a very, very, very long time. So uh, no wonder they can make like toy racing games that sell, you know, around 30 million units when racing games are supposed to be dead. And so it's ultimately it's a toy company. That's what it is. Um, video games as toys. So when you actually start to think it this way, uh, that's that's just a, a twist of the mind to actually think about pre-production. So hold toys, hold toys, <coughs> Star Wars. Star Wars. Yeah. So it's very important that that uh, your ability to actually turn back into back to in, in time. You know, I remember what what I it's probably not this toy then. By the way, I'm not that old, so <coughs> a lot of these toys are not the toys I used to play with. But it's it's important your ability to actually go back and try to remember, uh, not necessarily the toys you were playing, but how you were playing the toys that, that that you were playing at the time, you know, like you, everybody knows the story of like offering a toy to someone, to a kid, and he will play with a box uh, more than the toy itself. <coughs> um, so there are reasons for that. It's important to remember why you just that. So the toys nowadays are no different. You know, that's a toy. That's a toy. That's a toy. Of course, they were like, again, toys that were pretty sucky, and we played more with the box than in the toy itself. So, something that's pretty critical when you work on your game, whether you want to tell a story, or you want to change the world, or, or uh, you, um, I don't know, whatever you want to do, you know, do characters, you know, you, you wish you were a screenwriter, but you're turning into games because you didn't make it into screenwriting, or whether you actually want to entertain people. The key <coughs> part of making a video game is to understand the core fantasy uh, that is associated with your with what you want to do. Right? There is a core DNA thingy in this, in what you're gonna be doing, that's gonna be critical for you to succeed in your production. If you don't understand that, you're gonna be all over the place trying to figure out why your game is not fun and how you're going to make it fun. So, right, it's no different. It's it's always it's always been there. You know, yeah, give give a toy car to a kid. What does he do with it? Right? He does two things. He crashes it and he drifts. <laughs> <laughs> That's the crashing part. My car is the drift. drift right? <laughs> Uh, it's it's really understanding what what is at the bottom of it, really really core DNA human <coughs> behavior, and uh, and and you know again it's very difficult to it's and it's not that it's difficult it's very easy to to pack stuff on top you know I use uh, when at work I use a lot of uh, maybe it's because I'm French but uh, I use a lot of cooking comparison you know you know if you if you can hide your cake with a lot of stuff on top of it. <laughs> if it tastes like bad, <laughs> it will still taste bad. You know, you can do whatever you want on top of it. It's still not gonna be a good experience. So you have to understand what is the experience. Right. So, we're gonna talk about rabbits. Um, 
So why why Nintendo and why they suck in a way they don't understand the market and we're gonna die and whatever. Uh, so just to talk a little bit, I have several slides, you know, trying to convince why I actually pick Nintendo as an example. Uh, you know, hey, it's some credits I'd love to have. Um, you know, three games in the top ten. You know, top hundred games of all time. You know, he can smile. <coughs> he knows what he's doing. So we're going to talk a little bit about Mario 64. And uh, the reason we're going to talk about Mario 64 is that I was exposed to Mario 64 in '96, in '95, and '96 uh, through meetings at E3 with Miyamoto-san, and he told me a few things during these meetings that took me around 10 years to actually understand. To understand what it meant, uh, it, 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 uh, yeah, it took way too long. So just a quick reminder. It's me, Mario. Hello. Okay. Ninety-six. on uh, at Mario FX during the uh, Super NES years. So on Super Nintendo, they actually had a 3D chip with Star Fox on it and a few other titles. And at that point, they started to think about making Mario into a 3D game. So the first prototypes of Mario 64 were on, on Super NES. Released on the N64 as the killer app. And uh, the new MIPS processor at the time made, you know, three console possible that's what you know that's that's how they explained it right of course the PlayStation <coughs> before then was making 3D but Nintendo things in kind of like different way right <laughs> and I'll explain why still they are working um, so when I was uh, when I was at these meetings at the time with Nintendo uh, it's, it's a cute story. So my lead programmer at the time, I was at Angel Studios, my lead programmer saw Mario 64 uh, <coughs> the first day we were there and we had the meeting the second day. And my lead programmer, freaking genius, unable to finish anything, but really, really good. Uh, he basically saw Mario 64, you know, Mario running around, you know, we played, we played the game. And uh, the next day, he, he looked like really tired, and, and we were sitting at the meeting, and, uh, and the first thing he said is, before he even say hello uh, to Inyamura San, he, he said, hey, I've redone the Mario 64 camera. Uh, and everybody is very confused in the meeting, and Inyamura is like, what do you mean you've redone the Mario 64 camera? I don't understand what he means. He said, yes, you know, the, the Mario camera where you know, Mario's running around and the camera shows Mario's face and everything. It was the first time, you know, like really that you could see that in a console game in 3D where you could actually see uh, the character in 3D, Lara Croft, sorry, but you could only see her butt at the time. You know, there was no way to see like, the full 
experience. <laughs> but but uh, anyway, um, they uh, they uh, so it basically says you know have uh, freedom of money city for camera. So me and Will was very confused. He speaks English, by the way, and understands English perfectly, but he uses translator to actually win time, uh, give him an extra <laughs> length of time to to think about stuff. Uh, and uh, and so at one point he still asked the translator like what the hell you know what is he talking about like why why does he say it's with an and then finally it, it clicks and he understands how old you mean uh, this camera I did not understand because there's 120 cameras style in Mario 64 so when you say you already the Mario 64 camera I don't understand which one you're talking about there's 120 cameras in you know types in, in Mario 64. So we started to talk about, you know, like uh, the prototyping of Mario 64, and said two things that were very interesting to me that I didn't react on, and it sounds obvious now. But uh, the first thing was, well, when we decided to make Mario in 3D, the key decision to actually make Mario in 3D or not was, uh, are we going to be able to see his entire face? Because if it's to see his butt, we don't need 3D. <laughs> And if it's to see his side, we've already done that. Uh, so we need to be able to see his face. There's no point for us to invest, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars and a lot of resources if people go in 3D and they cannot see his face. So that already tells you, like, that they think a little bit different than everybody else. You know, they actually make the relationship between the hardware and the software and what it's for, right? And not a lot of companies actually work this way probably Apple um, but uh, you know so basically they uh, they said okay we're gonna try to uh, see if we can find a camera system or a way to actually see Mario's face so they made him run around work on the camera to actually see his face where, where he's running around uh, and uh, and that was hurting their fingers a lot uh, because it was not the analog stick it was the regular console stick you know uh, and so they came, they, they brought back the analog stick um, to the console industry. And uh, that was it. They, at one point, it actually did work. And they were able to show Mario's face and Mario running around. And it felt good. And they were happy. So Mario was going to be. Uh, but as they actually started to prototype this, they had a second issue, which is basically, um, well, what happens, you know, the a lot of the stuff gets completely broken if you bring Mario in enclosed environment. Like the camera goes through walls, you can't see anything. Uh, it's, it becomes very, very painful and they started to discover that actually 3D was a huge pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'm going ahead of the presentation, but I really like that part. Mm -hmm. So what they did is uh, something you can experience in Mario 64, which is the rabbit chase. At the bottom of the castle of Mario 64, there is a rabbit chase in corridors where you can actually catch a rabbit. You have to catch a rabbit called Mips from the microprocessor's name at the time. And what that prototype does basically is, is what was doing is basically put a 3D object controlled by an analog stick in the worst case scenario possible and see if they could solve it, right? If they could solve it, it was their second step to allow Mario, uh, even the company, to go into 3D. If these two prototypes were, n they could not solve it, they wouldn't have gone into the 3D industry at all. Because for them, there was no reason to go there if <coughs> it didn't work. So, again, it's like a, different way to think. So Miyamoto says to me, yeah, these are the two prototypes we work with, and and that's that, you know, once we figured out it was working, then we did Mario 64, and so we talk about our project, and I'm gone, and I'm like all happy playing Mario 64, and I didn't register, it didn't register yet. It took many years. So when you're working on something like that, you want to be able to deconstruct the fantasy of what they were trying to do with Mario, right? So doing the game in 3D <coughs> space, moving a character in 3D space, interaction with object in 3D 
face, which is a pain in the butt because, by the way, it's a 2D projection of a 3D world. So the Z perception, the depth perception, can be a problem. Uh, interaction with characters in 3D space, exploring 3D world, brings this. In prototyping, that means camera, movement and control, physics on code, AI, level design, which is everything that's on the rapid prototype. So they created NIPs, blah, 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 all the stuff I just talked about. So the key is chasing the rabbit. What is the rabbit chase? The rabbit chase is the worst case scenario for what you're trying to build. If when you prototype, you don't understand the corporate of what you're doing, and you don't actually prototype the worst case scenario, what's going to happen in your game, you're not prototyping anything. You're collecting your paycheck. You're making sure that you're comfortable and you're gonna have a job because you're sure you're not gonna fail. You have to fail. You have to put yourself in a very uncomfortable situation when you're prototype, or else it means you're not trying to solve anything. And it's gonna bite you back. I can guarantee you that at the end of pre-production, if you have not <coughs> prototyped something that is not a worst case scenario of your game, the worst thing that's gonna happen in your game, then you're not prototyping. So if you don't understand what you're doing, it's very hard for you to figure out what is the worst case scenario? So you'll stay in La La Land for the rest of pre-production, building quantities of, of stuff that are not actually proving anything, whether you can actually make the game or not make the game. <coughs> so the guy is pretty good. He's, he's been training for a long time. See the cameras? The cameras going around the walls? That case here, horrible camera case. If you're doing video games, it's actually pretty badass the way you manage to uh, analyze the long bow. Waiting. I don't know how long it is. So it's a really, really, really tough case. Like, I haven't <coughs> been in one project that involves third person camera you know, third-person characters like that, that is not struggling with this. Turns out, almost no one works on this in pre-production. No one. So it's very easy for me to solve issues in projects I work on when I, I land in a project, because I usually go and I say, well, are you actually addressing what is going to happen in your game? And I immediately make people stop everything they do, uh, discover the best people <coughs> in the company, and put them in the real issues that they have to address. So the rabbit is the worst case scenario. Uh, catching an object in 3D space that's moving um, while you're moving with the camera actually tracking in a tight corridor is pretty painful. It's really, really painful. But if you solve it, wow, how easy is it going to be to actually grab something that's just staying there, right? Or having other stuff happen. That's, that's the tough part. You have to solve this. And they all have to work together, right? So if you change one thing, everything changes. You cannot just like, that's the problem with hyper-specializing people. And you actually spread them across your studio, so there's one that is, you know, your program, your camera programmer, if you have one, is back there, and your animator is back there, and your control guy is back there, and your artist is there, and your level designer is there, that's not gonna work. You know, you're, gonna, you're gonna send emails to each other. What the hell? You know, you're, you're like 20 feet away. You have to put all these people very close together in one group, have as few people as possible, and solve this. And because everything's gonna have to be in equilibrium. So what's interesting with the rabbit is that, and the rabbit experiment is, is a very interesting one in, in the, at the neuronal network level. Uh, it's basically doing what, what humans are really, really good at, right? Uh, what we, re we are pattern recognition machines. What we, we survive because uh, the world is built around things that we can reproduce. Like the laws of physics are constant everywhere. If they were not, we'd be you know, probably completely crazy. It would still be hard, but uh, we'd be committing suicide 
much more, but we are looking for structure and patterns, right? So when we see something, we try to see if when we reproduce it in the same conditions, <coughs> it still works the same. And when it happens, uh, our brain that used to actually take all the energy for us for our survival, spend a lot of energy, that's not very efficient. So for our own survival, you actually burn a lot of calories when you think, you know, I don't know like, if you know, but you're, you're, it's pretty heavy. Um, it's trying to save energy, so it's gonna look for patterns, and as it looks for patterns, it reduces the amount of neurons and connections you're using to actually start to build freeways that goes directly from what I recognize to the conclusion that I'm gonna make of it, right? So it just goes from like, like that, I have no idea what's going on. And I'll try again, I'll try again, and I, it's consistent, and I can actually make a freeway, which is basically very low in en energy consumption and much faster. Right. And that releases very nice chemicals like dopamine, which makes you happy and addicted. You know? um, see, it's, it's, you don't need to use other drugs, it's all in there. You just have to make good games. Uh, the, uh, so the key is that basically the, the rabbit experiment is, is very interesting because the, when you build your own, you know, which is basically like, hey, if you have a third-person character game, you have to actually build prototypes where you chase something, because that's your worst-case scenario. The very critical part is also like the AI on court, like how that AI moves, because if there's no pattern in the AI, if you don't understand the next trajectory, so very often, it's gonna be that the, uh, the turns are very wide, and the reason the turns are wide and not like 180 degree turns you know, all the time is because you want to understand how the pattern works so you can actually do a shortcut. And n now that your freeway is built and you understand how the AI is moving, how much you need to push on the analog stick to turn, you know, that I basically like, I push forward, my characters move forward, ding! Dopamine, release, happy. I move to the left, it moves to the left, happy. I move more to, le to the left on the analog stick, it moves more to the left. Oh, that, that feels really good. Now I can actually start to put my eyes on what I'm trying to catch, and that thing has consistent patterns that I can accumulate, recognize, and act upon, and at one point I'm gonna make a shortcut and catch the rabbit. And brain very happy, and, um, and addiction to the point where I associate that addiction to dopamine with the Nintendo logo. Uh, and it happened with Apple, by the way, you know. Um, and there are a lot of other companies that actually know how, you know, know people. So the key is that in everything is that everything is, has to be worked on at the same time in parallel on the worst case scenario on, this, on, on just one thing. Sorry, yeah, probably taking too long. Um, so the rabbit integrates, incorporates all of the elements of uh, a gameplay toy into, into the prototype. It's a toy. The rabbit chase is a toy in itself. It's a full gameplay loop. There is a beginning and there is an end. There is a conclusion. Uh, it's a worst case scenario. Uh, it has analog control. You know, I can, I mean, it's skill based. I can get better at it. If your controls are purely digital and zero and one, it's very hard to progress. It's or you suck or you succeed, right? But it's very hard to actually build neural freeways if, if the system is not actually analog in itself. And the system is analog and at the input level, basically, where the more I, you know, after a while you don't, you don't look at, at your hand, you just feel the game, right? Um, and it's fun for several reasons. One of the reasons it's fun is because, yes, you're getting better at it. You have a bunch of dopamine released in your brain. And the other part is also that the visual actually match and the visual itself and the animation are fun. So it's several layers of fun. It's just the thing, you know. If it was just a cylinder running a <coughs> an, after another sphere and Mario was not actually running like this when he runs and doing stuff, it would be less fun. But at the dopamine level, at the at the neural network construction level, it is already fun. You know, <coughs> I learn, I progress, I see patterns, I release dopamine, I'm happy, I'm on drugs. Um, and then there is the other, other layer. That's why when you present prototypes to people that don't know about prototyping, you know, like, 
that doesn't look very fun. You know, it's like, are you gonna, is it gonna be gray like this? Or is it gonna <laughs> be a slender? Or is it gonna be like that? Yeah, because you're not playing, you know? So if you play, and it's actually the right prototype, whether it's a cylinder or not, it's still a fun toy to play at that level. And then when you look at it, and all people are spectators at it, they will have extra layers, or sound is the same way. On top of all the sign and feedback that actually sign and visuals bring to you. So I had this into, you know, that talk with Miyamoto at the time in 96, and, uh, and uh, I, so I go through my career, I work on my little things, and I still have that talk in my head, you know, and, and the uh, story of the rabbit thing, and I'm still very intrigued by it, and I still can't make sense of it, you know, like all these conclusions here came after a very long time and having confirmation, you know, from, uh, from these guys, and, uh, and, um, but they do it in a very intuitive level, you know. Uh, so at one point I'm like, did I, did I dream this? Or did I actually have that conversation? <coughs> Would did he talk about that rabbit prototype thing? Because I was like so much into it. So actually, not long ago, I actually found an article. Camera angel, and other angles. Uh, so there you go. So I had confirmation from <laughs> the man itself, from an old Nintendo Power October 96. And the funny thing is that Nintendo has been explaining to people how they do stuff forever it's all over the place every time they have an interview like i remember like the, when they were showing the 3ds at e3 they were showing their prototype you know they were basically showing like a, a a character on a bouncing pogo stick going across platforms in 3d and when you were going put the slider in 2d you can jump on anything you can perceive that and as soon as you put the, the, the thing in 3D, you could actually jump from every platform without hitting your head or jumping in the void. So uh, they actually show stuff to everybody all the time. They write about it. You know, the problem is, is that it needs to click at one point and it can take forever. And so, as I, the reason why it finally clicked for me is that, uh, and probably was in the shower, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> oh, Wave race, the dolphin. There's a dolphin in wave race. At the beginning, you can see the dolphin. You can follow the dolphin. That's their rabbit there. Zelda. Nice music. Uh, Zelda, the beginning of Zelda, Wind Waker. There is, uh, it's Link's birthday. And uh, basically, his sister come over and say, hey, what are you going to do for your birthday? And then he leaves the platforms, runs away. And uh, there is the first character he meets is actually a guy with his head on the grass, and the guy says, "Hey, can you help me catch my pig?" Wow! And there's a pig running around that you have to catch. Um, it doesn't mean the game is about catching pigs. Oh, by the way, there were chicken on the Super Nintendo version. <laughs> so these guys have been all over the place all the time, you know, as a as it was starting to actually make sense to me, I was going back and I was like, yeah, yeah, it's there, it's there, it's there, it's there, it's there. So every time they were making a game about characters used with a controller, they actually were doing gameplay prototypes this way. And again, it's in front of everybody and no one sees it, right? That one is an interesting one. So at one point I was working on a game, a first-person shooter, uh, with a Nintendo controller, and um, and I said to the team on um, the project, I said, "Okay, we're going to prototype, you know, like this way. We're going to have to understand what is the rabbit for a first-person shooter, uh, the Nintendo way, right? So what I did is basically brought them to um, We Play, and in We Play, there's a bunch of targets you can shoot at the very beginning. It's very simple. It's just targets that get displayed." And you have to point and shoot as many targets as possible before they disappear. Mm -hmm. And the guys looked at me like I was a moron. They're like, what do you mean? I mean, it's, it's trivial, right? On the Wii mode, right? And it's trivial. We've done we've just like super easy. It took them six months <coughs> to actually be able to do what Nintendo did uh, with that. And uh, what happens is basically 
uh, if you point with the remote at a target on the screen, uh, it can be fairly <coughs> precise. You know, it is, you know, when you just do this and point your cursor, it's precise. The problem is that it depends on the distance you're at, because you can be very precise if you're very close to the screen, very imprecise if you're really far. Um, the problem is not that, is that if you actually do one-on-one -on -one accuracy, you're going to miss the targets 100% of the time. It, you're, you will fail almost all the time. And yet, when you play replay, and you point at the target, you're actually pretty good at it, and you really get better at it. Something was going on. So, of course, I knew something was going on, because when it's easy, it means there's something really painful behind it. <laughs> so, they, they work, they work, they work, they try to find ways, and what they end up with, ended up with, that actually worked really well, was that the collisions on the 2D targets were actually plates <coughs> uh, like that, like curved. So if you were moving fast, it had a tendency to get you into the target, and if you were moving slow, it would get you like more at the center of the target. Of course, if you would stop, it would stop there, it would not slide you into the middle. Of the, uh, of the target, but it was basically assisting you as you were moving fast uh, into the target. And when you play, actually, we play and you look very closely, there is a pretty nice aiming assistance, an aim assist that's pretty hard to get. And uh, so I said, okay, we're gonna move. Congratulations, after six months of sweat, you know, and they finally made it, and so we had some champagne, and, um, and then I said, let's move on to the next one, which is basically, moving targets, right? And there is actually, we play another really nice example of that. And by the way, these type of games we play, we sport, it's all their prototypes that they just wrap up, you know, and, uh, and that you can enjoy. Um, so I said, okay, let's do the, the target practice thing, right? So there is that, the, the cans that you have to juggle, right? So you shoot at the cans, and you juggle the cans, and I said, okay, let's do that. So they do that. And of course, it's much harder because you actually have to go like from one target to another very quickly. And on the next layer for them, so they did that and that was pretty fast. And they said, okay, now since we are an FPS, our rabbit is gonna be uh, these kind of cans, but the camera, you're gonna have to look up at the same time as the cans are going up. And you basically have your Wemo to aim, <coughs> your Nunchuk and your nose need to actually look up as you're going up. And that took a very long time because moving the camera and aiming at the same time is really, really painful. So what's interesting in this story is that I said I suspect that the rabbit, the, the worst case scenario for an FPS in this case is that, that basically if you're able to solve this where you have multiple targets you have to shoot and have <coughs> reflexes false reflexes, you know, going from one can to the other very quickly. If you can solve this, you won't have any problem in your game with your targeting system. It's gonna work, the controls are gonna work. You know, after that, you know, it's, it's you've solved the main issues. Shooting on a static target is gonna be easy, and uh, you know, it's gonna work, and shooting on multiple targets with reflex involved, involved uh, it's also going to work. And uh, three days later, there's a guy that runs into my office all red with a GameCube. And he said, hey, I've got to show you something. I've got to show you something. And uh, I think I have it. Oh, sorry. fighting these systems is that you have to help the player, but if you help the player too much, there's no skill anymore. You don't get better, hence no dopamine, you're not happy, you're not addicted, and you're hooked on forever. Uh, <laughs> You see, like, so you no need to move the camera. So he comes, he runs at me, and he says, Hey, have you seen this? If you play Metroid uh, on Nintendo, that was released on uh, the GameCube previously, at the very, very beginning of the game, the very beginning, 
There is this game. You have to look up with the camera at the same time. So they, it's pretty consistent, you know? It, what it means is that basically, if you really want a prototype, it has to be really painful, mm -hmm. right? The reason why we give pre-production time is not for you to actually be comfortable, it, because you actually have to solve something very painful. Uh, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So of course prototypes can be pretty ugly, right? These are few Nintendo prototypes. Uh, so of course if you ask people like, you know, that are, that are actually looking at what the game is going to be, and you can play this and it's actually really fun, does it look like 99 million units? You know? Uh, no, it doesn't look like 99 you know, plus million units. It looks like nothing. <coughs> but it's there, it works. And by the way, the Super Smash Bros. prototype franchise of you know, 22.5 million units, it's the president of Nintendo that programmed it. Right? Mr. Iwata. He's a programmer, gameplay programmer. So I think he kind of like knows what he's talking about. Fun to play, fun to look at, you know, fun to hear also. Like all the senses need to be involved. I'm sorry if it's taking too long. So it's important to construct the core fantasy to as many gameplay prototypes as possible. Uh, for example, hey, if you do a Star Wars game about flying around and doing stuff, you know, like there's the, the chase is really important. That's human core, human DNA, you know? Like man has been chasing stuff forever. Like whether it's women or elephants or I mean, name it, it's like, it's, it's core, you know? The 3D vision and the senses we have is, is, is also for that, you know? So, it's very important to actually go deep into human DNA and understand what's going on. Uh, so you don't need hundreds of stuff. You know, you need a floor, you need a sky, and you need to chase something. If you start to put stuff on top of that and that part is not working, what's the point, right? And what is your rabbit for this, right? How are you, one of the key of the rabbit prototypes, again, is that they, uh, and it's very hard to do, um, by yourself is to provoke, provoke very uncomfortable situation for the player, so for you when you're making the game, but also for the player, reflex situations. Moments where you're gonna crank on the input, on the joystick, on anything, you're gonna crank like crazy because your brain has analyzed the situation. He, kn he knows what to do. If the controls do not, if the game does not respond to your input when it actually needs to, in fact, Having a plane that doesn't respond when, when you're in danger and you have a, a, a missile in your butt, or it's your, your, you're chased by a tiger and suddenly your legs let go. Right? I want you to turn. No, what about you turn? Run, right? So it's important that, that the rabbit prototypes actually provoke reflex moments. Or else, again, you're not doing anything that's special. Because what's going to happen is that you're going to go in, pro in production on, or at the end of pre production. Uh, you're gonna start to do your levels and put your story and all your stuff and hey, hey, what happens this time? Well, there are actually three guys that are <coughs> shooting at me at the same time. And this guy is pretty badass and I have to take care of this guy at the same time. If you haven't prototyped this reflex moment where I see that the, the badass is coming is gonna you know, kill me, you don't have that moment where you crank the joystick to actually not take care of this guy but take care of this guy. If you have not tested that, you're gonna be in trouble. Guarantee you, and it's happening 90% of the time. Then, when you have a few like gameplay prototypes, like the rabbit, for example, or Chase, or a few other prototypes together, uh, they have to actually work with each other. So that's going to be another part of the fil filtration. Like, uh, it, you know, your game is not just one one core gameplay. There are several gameplay cores usually in your game. Like examples of that is shooting and navigating. Uh, or running around, or uncharted, you know, shooting plus uh, plus navigation, just going around, traversal, right? So these two systems have to actually work together. Uh, that will force you to uh, modify and reject stuff <coughs> as you go. So again, if you're not able to, one, understand the core DNA stuff, uh, decompose that into prototypes, work on the worst case scenario, 
once you have one case solved, actually start to blend them together and see what still works, what still does, and what doesn't work, to modify it and make the same, actually, kind of like experiments work together, then you're not really doing virtual. <coughs> Uh, you will find that integration will be difficult, integrating prototypes together. Your assumptions will be challenged. What used to work doesn't work anymore. Or what you thought was going to work, you will have to start all over. Uh, but you really have to remember, it's not about how many times you fail, uh, but what you learn when you fail. It's okay to fail. Failure needs to be rewarded in prototyping. That's the danger with the Scrum stuff. Right? You don't want to tell your guys that after two weeks, it still doesn't freaking work. It's okay. It's good for you. As long as you've learned something in the meantime, right? Failure needs to be rewarded. It's critical. It's, it's, it's like, how, how do you think you've learned to walk? Right? Oh, I'm sorry, after two weeks, you haven't learned to walk. Uh, let's move on. Let's move to something else. Let's try to read. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's very important, you know, that that uh, that that people are all judged not by uh, the trouble they have doing something, but what they are learning in the process. Good design is not it's not about adding; it's about removing. You know, always. Remove, right? Joy. Remove the cracks. You know, there's no, there's no keyboard anymore. There's no file system. You know, it's gone. We don't want it. Good design is about removing. It's not. You're not going to show you're a good designer. It's the same with story writing, by the way, or anything like that, right? Um, it's not. You're not going to show you're good by adding garbage. No, that's that's not that's not gonna work. You're actually gonna show you're pretty good when you have something fun with as few things as possible, but that all combine together really, really well and release a bunch of dopamine into your brain and and addicted you know, to what you do. So fun game play loops, code is clearly defined for the player, catch the rabbit, shoot to juggle with the crate. Player learns from experience. Game provides feedback. That's the full feedback loop. You know, it's another. It's for. It's on the second part of the presentation. Uh, player can improve their performance. That's critical. You know, it means the system is analog. You're learning, and you get better. Uh, you apply your experience on it. Um, feedback loops are incredibly important. If you're in video games and you're not interested in cognitive sciences. Maybe you should a little bit. <laughs> you know, this kind of stuff, like what you see, what you input, your input at the wheel, how you're reading this, all this, all this kind of stuff. You know, it's been here forever. Uh, that's taken from a book called Game Feel. Actually, a guy that actually gets it. Um, feedback loops, what happens? When I look at the screen and it's a projected 2D image that gives me information, my brain processes, sends signal to my thumb or my finger or whatever. That goes into the game that analyzes what I've just did, provides a reaction from the game, the machine, that creates an image that's sent back to me that I analyze and it all looks like that. And actually, one thing that not a lot of people actually know about is that, and, uh, and it's very hard to explain, right, is that the best games out there, it's not just you looking at them. They look at you. They look at you very closely. And they are actually, you know, Halo and Call of Duty do that. You know, and no wonder they're at the top where everybody's still figuring out how it works, right? They actually understand your fancy, and they will give it to you if you see you stuck, you suck too much. You don't even see it, you know, but it's there. Uh, worst case scenarios, stress test, real game scenarios, real game scenarios, you know, stuff you're going to have in your game. Stressful conditions, stress the system. You know, it's like, hey, it's a good thing we don't prototype, you know, the guys that actually build brakes don't prototype like we do. Right? <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm pretty lucky, you know. I mean, when the prototype breaks, I've got like my uh, my brother I know actually works at Bosch that he breaks, and he says he explained to me how they they test their brakes. So there is a layer of uh, dry concrete, and then there's gravel and sand and ice and snow and fog and rain and freezing and they send the car and if the car can actually use its brakes it goes to consumer products it goes into the car into your car right if we were prototyping that way you know if we're prototyping brakes we'd be on a dry we try it on the on a on the dry surface you know on the parking lot of Safeway or whatever but brakes done <laughs> Ouch. Stress. Stress test. What else? Right? Same thing with that, right? They freaking destroy the car. You know? They destroy it. <coughs> it's my code. It's so beautiful. It's my design. Uh, analog controls. Yeah, I told you I was perfect. Analog control, skill-based input, very important. Analog jump on Mario. The longer I press on the jump, the higher I get. What does it do? Well, basically, when I'm a beginner and I start to play, I have a tendency to overpress on the button because I don't know the relationship between how long I press and the height of the jump. So when I press a long time as a beginner, as a beginner, you don't have a tendency to be like, I just press a little bit. You, you, you press buttons, right? You jump really high, and it's pretty good for you because it actually saves your butt, you know, because you over jump. Like, hey, that works really well. As I'm learning, I actually know better how to optimize my jump, and actually the game plays with that as you're progressing along the jump, uh, in knowing that you are going to get better at understanding, you know, how much input you need to put to actually get the correct length or kind of height of the jump. Analog system. Very, very important. Skill based, right? You can improve. You can see very clearly that you're improving. You can see that you're improving. Right? And again, you know, what's very important is, is in the game, it's, it's also true. Um, and, and that's where playtests can be extremely dangerous when they are not done properly. Uh, when you do playtests the wrong way, you look at people fail and you say, we have to correct this. We have to correct this, and the door, you know, they can't see the door, so we're going to correct the door. They can't see this, we're going to change the textures, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Without understanding what's really happening. It's okay that people fail. You know, at Disney, I did something really interesting, which was a reverse playtest, where I take a game that's incredibly successful, where it can't be denied, and people can see how people screw up. You know, so I take a game like Mario Kart, right, and I put kids that have never played Mario Kart in front of it. Right? And they will fail. That's fine. The key is how fast they learn and how much there is to learn. Failing is not the issue. It's, it's failing to learn that's the issue. Right? So when you do playtests and you don't do it carefully, there is a tendency to micro-correct issues without understanding what's really happening. That it's okay that people fail when they are playtesting your game. The key is how fast they learn and is there actually anything to learn. Because if there's nothing to learn and progress upon, your brain is not going to be happy. Or your brain is not going to make your body happy. So the difficulty of balancing, you know, assisting, you know, assisting the player and removing like complete learning, right? So if you take a, a first-person shooter, if you uh, remove the the, if you assist the player too much, you basically snap the aiming from one target to the other automatically. The problem is that there is the margin to actually learn and progress and release dopamine and be happy is, is very limited. And so it becomes boring very, very quickly. It's hard to stay in the zone, you know, and the flow. Um, you basically hit one of the borders of flow, which is boredom. And uh, if you remove assistance, uh, then the game becomes too hard. And it's very, can become very difficult to actually find a pattern. So you've got games like, I'm sorry if you like Killzone, but they still don't get it, right? There's almost no aim assist in it, so you're gonna run after a guy and try to shoot the guy, and you're gonna be like that with your cursor, trying to aim at the guy, because the game is not actually helping you uh, with the aiming. That's the story of like 
hitting the targets in the, in the Wii game and stuff like that. So the, the code, the game has to help you, uh, but not so much that it assists you and you have nothing to do. Uh, so uh, the best games actually are really good at that. Uh, the best designers are really good at that. So that's why I mentioned, you know, you, you really have to make, right? Because these, the fundamentals, the core system that is underlying your game idea, they are what's going to make the game work. Because if your controls are annoying and your camera <coughs> is all over the place, and you can make the guy run around, you really believe people are going to care about the story and your character? It's never going to happen. You know? Why do you think people still chase the princess and don't absolutely care that she's still in another castle? Right? They don't care about the story. They, they, they don't. If you want your core, if you are working on an action game and you want the story to be very relevant, you have to be careful that the frustration gauge is not all the way up that people actually don't care anymore. Because, you know, the opposite of the chemicals kicks in. So finding the equilibrium between the two is really, really hard. That's really painful. Yes, making really good games is really hard. Sorry. Uh, make sure you're uh, focusing on the right skills, because sometimes, you know, like, uh, you can actually think you are at the core of the DNA of the stuff, but you might not be there. Uh, the right brain chemicals. Maybe I was had an intention there. Anyway, that oh yeah, that's the story of uh, Mario running around. That actually when. Uh, when you're running around, he actually puts his arm like this and does this, right? So again, it's the fun to look at and uh, fun to play. Uh, full gameplay loops, worst case scenarios, analog control, skill based, fun at several levels, combine and merge. Right. Embrace the unexpected, so it's a very hard thing to do go wide. It's, it's a zen exercise, right? Um, allow players to show up. Rocket jump. <coughs> Still no video. Rocket jump in, uh, in, uh, in the old Quake game, right? You can exploit it. It's an hour. Show off. People can show off. So they basically use their rocket, you know, the rocket they shoot at, to actually shoot at the ground and jump with it. Right? So they. Because the system is analog, you can exploit it. <coughs> you have people that are really good at it exploit it. There are other ones. I like this one. If you're uh sorry, the wheel spinning. So the sound is pretty bad. So this guy is giving tutorials on Call of Duty. <laughs> That's awesome. What up guys, Goop Brett 2 here, and today I got a quick scope tutorial for you guys, and uh, I'm going to show you the difference between a quick scope, a pop shot, a black shot, an E shot, and uh, a few other things. As you can see, oh yeah, and 360s obviously. <laughs> Off the top of the map, the 360 game winner jump shot, um, that was a quick scope. I did, as you can hear, hold my breath for a millisecond, but... Since the, um, the scope is in under uh, one second long, it's categorized as a quick scope. And uh, yeah, I went on a little terror there. I know it's a private match, but uh, don't worry. I have some online matches too. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because it's analog. You don't, you don't code this stuff. <laughs> Looking ahead, so the second part of the presentation, which I'm recording to today, uh, talks about uh, uh, gray boxing. You know, like uh, the next step in prototyping, how you prototype, <coughs> what kind of environment. Uh, if you actually in some Nintendo games, you can actually hack 
uh, the games with cartridges like Game Shark, and you can find the prototyping levels inside the game. And they don't remove them. It's still there. Uh, the reason it's still there in the game is that they don't write game design documents. They don't have game design documents. They don't have game design documents. <laughs> <laughs> what they have is this. It's the Ten Commandments of the game. Once the pre-production is done, everything can be measured through the centimeter. Actually, the grid means something, where in a lot of prototypes, the grid means nothing at all. Right? We just do great boxing because I heard it. I was supposed to do great boxing. <coughs> So anyway, that's uh, that's on the uh, next one, next presentation. Jeans, uh, gray boxing test levels, you know, you name it. Level design, the big, the big game killer. Level design, slaughterer of uh, good pre-production. Uh, accessible level design and difficulty curves. The importance of AI, cloning as a tool. Signs and feedback for the feedback loop. And that's it. system. 
you know, I don't care that people uh, judge me as a bad designer because I screw up. It's because they don't get it, right? It's, so they don't get it, but their problem is not my problem. I don't know why I should stress about it. So yes, it's a very stressful industry, but it's like everything, you know, you can make it as stressful as, uh, as you want, you know. You have to be, again, it's not cancer, it's all it. You have someone on the table. Like, yes? With, uh, okay. No, it's fine. Uh, with the Nintendo way, is there a room for prototyping that's not directly in the game? I mean, it seems to be against paper. Is there any way to make a uh, pared down your prototype and not have it be directly? It depends what you want to uh, what you want to prototype. If if it's your meta gameplay, for example, you know, or how certain things work, yes, you can do it on paper. But if there is character and 3D movements involved or targeting, no, it's not going to work. So it's good. It, it really depends on your ability to understand what you're trying to prototype. You know, because it might mean nothing. But so I've seen a lot of prototypes like uh, done in Flash. You know, it's like, oh, that's the way. It, you know, so the AI is coming, and it comes from the back, and everything. And then you put it on 3D, and because it's in 3D, you don't see what's behind you. So in Flash, it was top view, and you could see what's coming behind. You put it in 3D, you don't see what's coming behind you. It's irrelevant, right? Uh, so hence the name of the company. I think we have time for one more. Um, I, I just wanted to say thank you so much for um, confirming a lot of a lot of the thoughts that I've had. I actually worked at a very document-bound company oh, no. a few years ago, and I can say without um, without a shadow of a doubt that they okay. failed. Yeah, it's going to be a good game, right? Yeah, yeah, go. Oh, God. don't get me started. My question is, while as a level designer, I believe massively in rapid prototyping, you know, I, I come from the mod world, build it, test it, play mm -hmm. test. I love that system. What happens in an environment where they're trying to make a heavily story-based game and there's a lot of, well, you didn't follow the story here, but I'm trying to iterate and make something fun. What do you do in those kinds of well, scenarios? That's, that's the part of your iteration process, right? Yeah. It's, uh, the, the problem is, is that uh, uh, that's, your, that's your problem. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's part of the problem you have to solve. You know, it's basically how do you accommodate both sides of... of uh, game making in that case you know it, it, it is just like yeah how uh, you have to approach it the same way yeah. you know how 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 can I accommodate mm -hmm. and of course it's very difficult because you know <coughs> yeah storytelling and level making are not, are not, not the same thing at all in that so case, it, it, it is really like a in that case uh, the story writer has to be just as willing to uh, get rid of his ego that's, that's yeah. true to yeah. deal with changes that you discover yeah. and the good ones are okay with that Uh, maybe you'll join us at El Prada. Uh, yeah? Yeah, why not? <laughs> 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 <laughs>